which comes in both single and dual lumen designs. The Hickman dual lumen catheters provide additional access for blood drawing and IV therapy. In fact, the Hickman round dual lumen catheter has the advantage of a large dual lumen within a round outer profile that is easier to insert and less traumatic to the patient's venous system. This list summarizes the types of Hickman and Broviac catheters available. As we look at how the devices are used, note that all procedures apply to both single and dual lumen Hickman catheters unless noted. These multi-purpose catheters give direct access to the patient's central venous system. In addition to blood drawing, they can be used for infusion of parenteral nutrition solutions, blood and blood products, chemotherapeutic agents, antibiotics, and other commonly administered IV solutions. Note that the catheter is usually inserted into the subclavian vein or by cut down into the external jugular vein. The tip of the catheter is usually positioned in the lower superior vena cava at the entrance to the right atrium. The external portion of the catheter exits via a subcutaneous tunnel, usually at a point between the nipple and sternum. Let's look at nursing care of the Hickman catheter throughout the patient's hospital stay. We'll take it step by step and look at ideal preoperative care, postoperative care, irrigation and heparin lock procedures, blood drawing, dressing changes, plus how to repair a damaged catheter. The emphasis of preoperative care is to reduce the patient's anxiety prior to the procedure. It is important to explain the insertion technique to the patient and to answer any questions that the patient or family may have. On the evening before the insertion procedure, have the patient bathe or shower with povidone iodine solution. On the day of insertion, scrub the patient's upper torso with povidone iodine solution for five minutes from chin to waist and right axilla to left axilla. When the patient returns from surgery, examine the new catheter. Start by removing the dressing applied in surgery. Check the exit site and cut down incision for bleeding and swelling. Apply a new gauze dressing. Sterile dressing change kits are available from Davol. If drainage is excessive, follow your hospital's standard procedures such as placing a five pound sandbag over the new dressing. If swelling is excessive, place an ice pack over the dressing. It is very important to note that even if clamps are not placed on the Hickman catheter in surgery, they must be in place before removing the catheter cap. This avoids an air embolism. Some Hickman catheters have pre-attached clamps. They should be fastened over the reinforced segment of the catheter legs. Those Hickman catheters without pre-attached clamps should have clamps fastened over tape to protect the catheter. Here's how to prepare the tape. First, take a piece of plastic tape that's two inches long and one inch wide. Fold the ends back to form tabs and wrap the tape around the catheter close to the external end. Place a smooth edge clamp over the tape protected catheter. You'll repeat this process weekly changing the location of the tape tab on the catheter each time. The new catheter should be irrigated to confirm patency when the patient returns from the procedure room. You'll need the following supplies. A three milliliter syringe, sterile heparinized saline in dilution of 10 or 100 units per milliliter, a lure lock injection site cap, such as the Hickman injection cap, and an alcohol wipe. Sterile heparin lock kits containing these components are available from Dayball. Hickman injection caps are supplied with each Hickman and Broviac catheter. The catheter should be irrigated through an injection cap. If the catheter does not have an injection cap in place, clamp the catheter and remove any locking cap or other connector. Then replace it with an injection cap. Using sterile procedure, withdraw three milliliters of sterile heparinized saline solution into the syringe. Recap the needle and set aside. You may also use pre-filled, pre-packaged syringes of heparinized saline. Thoroughly clean the injection cap with an alcohol wipe or a povidone iodine prep swab. Insert the needle through the injection cap. 
To avoid puncturing the catheter, do not use needles longer than one inch in length. Release the catheter clamp and begin injecting the sterile heparinized saline. As you inject the last half milliliter of solution, clamp the line. This clamp must remain in place as long as the line is not being used and must be clamped as you inject the last half milliliter. When you clamp the line like this, you prevent the backflow of blood at the catheter tip and help to prevent clotting. Now remove the needle and syringe from the injection port. Tape the injection cap securely with a two inch piece of plastic tape. The catheter is now heparin locked. Finally, secure the catheter to the patient's clothing. Note that both sides of a dual lumen catheter require irrigating and clamping. When the catheter is not in daily use, you should perform this irrigation procedure daily and replace the injection cap weekly. While recent clinical evidence suggests that irrigation is not needed this frequently, further investigation is required to confirm the efficacy of less frequent irrigation. Now let's look at how easy the Hickman catheter makes obtaining blood samples. Before you begin, assemble the following supplies. Alcohol or povidone iodine wipes, five to six milliliter syringe with needle, syringe for blood sample, three milliliter syringe filled with normal saline and labeled blood tubes. If an IV is running, stop the infusion and clamp the catheter. If the patient has a double lumen catheter, turn off all infusions running in either lumen. Remove the tape at the connection between the catheter and IV tubing. Clean the connection with an alcohol wipe or povidone iodine swab. Remove the IV tubing from the catheter and connect the six milliliter syringe. Pay strict attention to asepsis whenever handling the catheter, especially at the connector. Place a needle on the end of the tubing. This will function as a temporary sterile cap. Set this tubing aside. If a heparin lock is in place, remove the tape and cleanse the connection. Then remove the cap and attach the six milliliter syringe. Remove the clamp and draw up six milliliters into the syringe. This purges the catheter of any solution which could contaminate the blood sample. Reclamp the catheter, remove the six milliliter syringe and discard it. Connect the new syringe for blood sampling and remove the clamp. Draw up the amount of blood needed, replace the clamp and remove the syringe. Now irrigate by connecting the three milliliter syringe filled with saline to the catheter. Remove the clamp and inject the saline. Then replace the clamp. Inject the blood into the labeled tubes. If the patient has a dual lumen catheter that is heparin locked, you must also irrigate the side that is not being used for blood drawing. It is not necessary to irrigate if there is an infusion running in this lumen. Cleanse the outside connection with an alcohol wipe while the syringe is still in place. To resume an infusion, reconnect the IV tubing and remove the clamp. If an infusion is not started, heparin lock the catheter through a newly placed injection cap. In either case, tape the connection with two inch plastic tape and secure the catheter to the patient's gown. Let's look at dressing the catheter. Catheter dressing changes are part of the catheter's daily care. This is because both the primary incision and the cutaneous exit site are potential areas for infection. You should clean and dress the incision site daily until it heals. To change the catheter dressing, assemble the following materials. 3% hydrogen peroxide, sterile cotton tip swabs, povidone iodine swabs, povidone ointment, sterile 2x2 gauze pads, sterile 2x2 IV sponges, note that the sponges are optional, one inch paper tape, and alcohol wipes. Sterile dressing change kits containing these components are available from Dayball. It's not necessary to wear gloves when handling the catheter, but it is important that you wash your hands thoroughly. Now remove the dressing. Check the exit site for redness, swelling, tenderness, and drainage. Now wash your hands again. Clean the exit site of any residue or crusting. 
using sterile cotton tip swabs dipped in three per hydrogen peroxide. Begin cleaning with a circular motion, starting at the exit site, and move outward to the surrounding skin. Note that exit site cleansing should include the skin under the catheter. Be gentle when cleaning this area, as this is often the most tender area of the exit site. When you finish cleaning with peroxide, dry the area with sterile cotton tip swabs. Now reclean the entire area with a povidone iodine swab using the same circular cleaning motion. Excess povidone iodine may be removed with a sterile swab or gauze pad. Apply povidone iodine ointment into the exit site with a sterile cotton tip swab or gauze pad. Use an alcohol wipe to clean the line from the exit site toward the adapter end of the catheter. Be careful not to contaminate the cleaned exit site. There are several options for dressing the exit site. We'll consider some of them. One method is to remove two sterile 2x2 two two gauze pads from their packages. Place one under the catheter and one over the catheter at the exit site. Touch only the edge or upper surface of the gauze pads, maintaining the sterility of the dressing surfaces that will contact the patient. Now tape the dressing in place. Another option is to use a prepackaged 2x2 IV sponge with a slit. Position two IV sponges so that the catheter can exit through the center of the sponges. Cover the slit with a gauze pad and tape the dressing to the patient's skin. Adhesive transparent dressings have also been found to be an effective alternative to the standard gauze and tape dressings. Note that the catheter dressing should be changed daily if the patient's granulocyte count is less than 200 cubic millimeters. Otherwise, change the dressing three times a week. Now, let's look at the proper method of repairing a Hickman catheter. Catheters are most often damaged by scissors, clamps, and hemostats with teeth. There are three simple rules to protect the catheter. One, avoid using scissors near the catheter. Two, use only smooth edge clamps. And three, when using a catheter with clamps, always clamp the catheter over the reinforced segment or applied tape tab. We have already seen how to do this. A damaged catheter, one that leaks, has been cut or punctured, is an emergency and should be clamped immediately to avoid blood loss or air embolus. To clamp, place a smooth edge clamp between the damaged portion and the chest wall. A damaged Hickman catheter can be repaired if four centimeters or more of the intact catheter extend from the chest wall. There are permanent repair kits available for all Hickman and Brobiac catheters. Because these catheters have different lumen sizes, it is important that the proper repair kit is used. To repair a catheter, you must first prepare a sterile field. Use a sterile towel or drape. Lay out the items from the repair kit, plus alcohol wipes, gauze sponges, and sterile scissors on the sterile field. Wear sterile gloves. Using a povidone iodine swab, cleanse for two minutes the portion of damaged catheter to be spliced. Allow it to air dry. Change into a second pair of sterile gloves. Clean the powder from the gloves with an alcohol prep and gauze sponge. Now remove the plunger and load the syringe barrel with one milliliter of adhesive. Reinsert the plunger. Attach the blunt end needle to the syringe. Set this syringe aside. Using sterile scissors, Trim the catheter, leaving as much of the undamaged catheter intact as possible. Then cut the replacement segment so that the repaired catheter is the desired length. This is usually no longer than 15 to 20 centimeters from the chest wall. If not pre-inserted, insert the splice connector into the repair segment. Please note that repair kits for the new Hickman Round Dual Lumen catheters and some of the smaller Broviac catheter repair segments are provided with splice connectors that are pre-inserted. Check to ensure that the splice sleeve is mounted on the catheter replacement segment. Insert the damaged catheter over the other side of the splice connector. Now slide the splice sleeve over the connecting ends so that the ends are positioned in the middle of the sleeve. Alcohol may be used as a lubricant to ease movement. Using the blunt end needle, 
inject adhesive under both ends of the sleeve. Roll the sleeve between your fingers to evenly spread the adhesive. Remove the excess with sterile 4x4 gauze pads. Allow two hours for the adhesive to dry before using the repaired catheter for infusion. To protect this connection while the adhesive dries, splint the joint with a tongue blade, cover with gauze and tape securely. The repaired junction must remain splinted 48 hours to achieve full strength. After that time, the splint may be removed. After you repair the catheter, you'll still have air remaining in the replacement segment. To remove this air, attach a six milliliter syringe to the injection cap end of the repaired catheter. Unclamp the catheter and pull back until blood fills the replacement segment. Clamp and irrigate the catheter with normal saline and complete the procedure with a heparin lock. You can be assured that a properly repaired catheter may be used with confidence. For complete details on the procedures covered in this program, see Rosemary Ford's article in the March-April 1985 issue of the National Intravenous Therapy Association Journal or contact Dayball directly. Thank you for your attention.